Hi, everyone. Welcome to the BizDev Podcast, the podcast about developing your business. I'm David Baxter, your host, and I am joined, as always, by Gary Voigt, who has taken up a new hobby of lion taming. How's that going, man? It's a little scary, but I can get through it. The only thing that really scares me is um, yeah. I think I'm supposed to have some sort of whip or some sort of safety Devices, no, they don't. You allow whips anymore. Only feathers. the circus that I'm training with, they're just like, mm -hmm. go for it. And so go for it. Have you stuck your head in the mouth yet? No, no. My hand got in there no. and uh, that's about it. Won't do that. You're still, you lost, uh, you lost that hand. Well, he's got no teeth. I mean, they're dangerous. They, they're <laughs> so, yeah, that's they good, don't stick good. me go in for the really old real ones. ones. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, guys. that makes sense. Perfect. More importantly, we are joined by Jason Bates, who is the chief growth officer, officer, I'm going to say that right, chief growth officer at Corporate Chaplains of America, uh, which I should say we are a client of. That is completely coincidental, by the way. We did not uh, grab Jason because we are a client. That just happened to happen. Uh, Christy uh, sent out the the lasso and we got you and she was like, hey, this is cool. I was like, hey, we use them. Anyway. So we know a little bit about corporate chaplains and we've mentioned you guys on the podcast before, uh, yes. but how are you, Jason? Let me start that. Hello. I'm, I'm doing great. Uh, David, Gary, how are both you doing? I cannot complain. I see uh, you, you're, you're not missing any fingers or anything, uh, Gary, right? So I guess the, well, the line one. team. Yeah, you're good. You're good. <laughs> just not important. Though. You don't need that one. If yeah, you lose right. too many more though, you have to be fired. So, you know, so the, I'll just, duct tape the Wacom to my hand. Just use it. Perfect. Perfect. All righty. So Corporate Chaplains of America, I am a fan, clearly. Uh, but for those who don't know, can you tell us a little bit about what you guys do? Yeah, good, good question. Because probably most people listening to this don't have a clue what chaplaincy is all about. You know, uh, we're a, uh, a nonprofit based in Wake Forest, North Carolina. Uh, started back in 1996 by a, a sweet, uh, a sweet guy and his wife, uh, Dr. Mark Kress and his wife, Linda. And really they had a, a heart to care for their employees. You know, he was a, I'd call him a serial entrepreneur and um, really got in a position um, where he had some employees that were battling some struggles in their life at home with their kids, with their family, with, fill in the blank, illness, sickness, death, uh, things that we all deal with in our lives, uh, uh, personal or other, and uh, really had a heart for caring for his employees. So uh, uh -oh. ventured out and um, actually went to Man school down. there in Wake, Wake Forest and, uh, and started Corporate Chaplains of America. And so what this looks like in corporate America, we support about a thousand companies nationwide, our largest being a publicly traded company with 17,000 employees and our smallest being a, a uh, you know, a dozen uh, employee car dealership or maybe a smaller law office and everything in between. Small we development company. There you go. There you go. Those are our favorite though, Gary, uh, David, the, the development companies. But we, uh, you know, what, what this looks like uh, to an employee of a company that we support our chaplains or care coaches, depending on what you want to call them, come through and, and uh, visit weekly with the employees. Everything's permission-based. Uh, confidential. It's voluntary. It's not weird. These aren't like, you know, pastors coming in or anything like that. They're really just uh, trained uh, individuals, certified chaplains that come in and just provide care for your employees. So again, everything's permission-based and voluntary. It's a benefit that's paid for by the companies. And uh, so it's a free benefit for the employees. Our chaplains are available 24, seven, 365. And, uh, we did 4.124 million contacts l last year. I just looked it up the other day. So wow. you think of over 4 million contacts with all these employees and these about 1,000 companies I just mentioned. About 10% of those, uh, David, will turn into what we call a care session. It's somebody trying to navigate through a bad diagnosis in the hospital. Um, I you know, heard the other day about you know a child in a car wreck. I mean, these are just some of the stories that just you know unfortunately is a if you're a leader in a company you're trying to support your employees as they navigate this through trials and uh we try to come alongside those employers and those employees and be a another person to provide care so we got you guys so i'm a member of c12 which i've mentioned several times 
and they are huge fans of y'all clearly. Uh, and they always mention you. And the way reason I was uh, attracted to using uh, chaplains is I want, I wanted a mental health aspect to our culture and our care for them. And cause our job is stressful. It's mentally very taxing. Um, and a lot of guys get overwhelmed and I wanted them to know that we cared. And that goes for everybody at the company, of course, not just the devs, but it is, it was important to us. And I also wanted to make sure like, so big pixel is a Christian based company, but our people aren't not necessarily. And so we wanted to make sure that whatever yeah. we brought in wasn't too overwhelming in that direction. Um, and so it was a good mix. It's worked out really well. Uh, we've had two different chaplains. Um, and our, our current chaplain has, uh, gotten another job. So we're actually in the middle of transition, but, uh, they've been, well, no. And I will tell you, this is, has nothing to do with anything except for I am, and it sounds like an ad and it's not meant to sound like an ad, but the thing that most impressed me, so Derek was our last chaplain. Um, and when he decided to go get another job that was closer to his house, he knew that there was a transition from one chaplain to another, which takes several weeks because they got to hire up and all that. And he has voluntarily stayed as our chaplain. Totally. Uh, he's totally not associated with anything. He just wanted to make sure that we were cared for while we were doing transition. And so he's still in our Slack and he still chats with us from time to time. And I think that's amazing. I think that tells you the quality of the people that you guys have working for you. Um, yeah. And I, you know, well, and, you know, you bring up a good point, David. So when, you know, you, th you talk about even your employees and providing, you know, because you're a leader, you're a good leader, I'm sure, your, your team, you've got great people on your team, but you have employees that have like real world problems. So what happens is they come in and want to shut the door and like talk to you about um, the uh, domestic abuse that's going on. Or, I mean, there's some things like you're kind of like, do I need to report this or do I mean like, or am I sure. qualified to give marriage advice or how to, you know, for somebody that may have never had children's in a leadership role. And then somebody's coming in and saying, I got this bad, great, bad, crazy kid. Like, how do I, like, I don't I mean there, there's this overwhelming sense of, of some of your employees probably don't feel qualified to give coaching, but because they're good people, they're going to shut the door and listen and maybe kind of fumble through that. And that's where we get to come along where I would say we are, qualified for those kind of things. So when the, somebody wants to shut the door and maybe burst into tears about something's going, their, the locks are getting changed at their house because they made a foolish decision the Friday night before, we're able to come in and help navigate that on both ends of the family. But it's just a drastic example, but unfortunately it happens every single week in what we do. Yeah. To me, it was that I didn't, I knew people didn't want to confide in me what's happening you know, as the, the boss or whatever, that's not yeah. a comfortable situation. And so I wanted them to have a place to go. Um, and I can't tell you because it is anonymous. I can't tell you how many people use it because I have no idea, but I know that there's an effort. And I know some of them uh, have made pretty close bonds. Like I know Derek went and visited Ryan, one of our guys, at, at one of in Florida, he went down, he was going on vacation and visited Ryan. I mean, they had created a bond of that because we're all remote. So they were all over the place. And yeah, so I thought that was really cool. Um, Gary, did you have any questions I, before I change subjects? Go ahead. Oh, I was going to mention too. Um, sometimes saying corporate, ch corporate chaplain, uh, again, gives the idea, like you were saying, Big Pixel is a Christian-based company, but not every employee is Christian. So sure. there's a little bit of, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? People will assume that it's going to be like religious-based advice or help, which it is not. It is just human-based, you know, care. I guess you can say that way. Yeah. Yeah. And we, yeah, uh, Gary, good point. We have some companies that call our chaplains care coaches, right? Just for whatever reason, even though there's chaplains in the sports team down the road, there's chaplains in the hospital, there's chaplains in the military, there's chaplains at the police department. I mean, I, you know, uh, we don't want the word chaplain to be a stumbling block for anybody to want to partner with us and provide care. So we, like I said, we have some companies that even just use the word care coach, what they think this, it's fitting for their organization. We're, we're fine with that too. Uh, yeah, we are, we are not trying to uh, push anything any, down anybody's throat at all. What we're really trying to do is come in 
uh, like one of our customers said the other day, he said, uh, chaplaincy allows me to care for my employee like my heart wants to, but my time and my title doesn't allow me to do that. I think that probably summed it up when he said that, you know, it's like, I want to, like you said, David, it's like when you're writing the checks, you're the boss. It's like some things, one, you may not want to hear about. uh, And two, there's some, you know, you want to, you want somebody to hear about them if if your employees are going through some kind of stressful situation in their life. So our chaplains are trained. I mean, they're, they're, they've got seven to eight years of real work experience and business world outside of any kind of, uh, uh, you know, ministerial work or anything like that. So these are these are folks that have been in a been in a, a job or a cube or an office uh, also. So we're we're thankful that uh, you allow us to serve your your company. And we do provide metrics using our CRM tool uh, of how many visits we make monthly. So you get you we can produce all that stuff, David. So you can see that monthly of the engagement, what people are engaging about. Again, since it's confidential, you're not going to see who we talk to or necessarily what state they're sure. in. So you can you can't dial in and figure out what's going on, but uh, but you'll get a high level overview if your employees are struggling with, for example, domestic issues in their home or something like that, or maybe you may have an employee that has a child that has some kind of addiction issue, and uh, we're navigating through that. Um, yeah, we, we we can give good reporting if you need it. So you are a leadership development expert. That's what your LinkedIn says. So now we're getting more personal to you. What does that mean? That sounds awesome. Yeah. 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 I don't even recall that's what it says, but I'll tell you what, it, here's what it means to me. <laughs> and I have been fortunate. Uh, I have had some really good mentors in my life, uh, business people that have brought me up underneath that I have, I felt like I have not been worthy uh, to follow in their shadows. And, and Larry Griffith, our CEO, uh, is one of those. He, uh, he and I became friends in probably 2003 ish time frame. Uh, he and I were both working in the telecom sector at the time and had been for a number of years. He and I both kind of moved all over the country with this particular company that uh, ultimately ended up getting acquired by Verizon. But, uh, when I think of leadership, I would say development, I think of, it's probably circa 2004 or five. David, we sat down uh, at the time I was living in uh, New Orleans. I was a, a VP GM of sales or kind of for that uh, Mississippi and uh, uh, South Louisiana market. And we were trying to, uh, we were doing some reorgs throughout the organization. And we really sat down and said, you know, we just need, we need to do a better job of developing our leaders and what should that look like? And we all sat down. And uh, we're obviously a faith-based organization, and uh, you've, you've already admitted that about your own organization, David. But we sat down and, um, and thought, you know, how do people want to be treated? And so we went through this whole series of how do we really serve our teams uh, to help them be excellent in what they do, how they then lead their teams. And we went through a whole uh, several-month process of going through a book you probably never heard of it, called The Servant. Uh, James C. Hunter, I think was his name that wrote it. And we bought the, whatever, the $900 DVD series and went through the whole deal and um, and really trained our frontline leaders. And here's what we found. We had some leaders that were just in the wrong spot. So we we uh, moved some people to other organizations. We eliminated some positions. We brought some other people in. And what we found in that whole process is that if we flip that paradigm, and this is kind of, that you hear servant leadership all the time, but you know, almost 20 years ago, it wasn't that big of a buzzword. But we, we were in the retail sales business of wireless sales, right? So think of the Verizons, the AT&T, the T-Mobile, kind of your big three you see today. Uh, we were one of, there you know, used to be 15, 20 of those carriers, and we were one of those kind of tier B carriers at the time. And um, what we found was, is everything's transactional, it's retail, it's fast pace, it's, your your employees are kind of on this commission piece too. They've got a base, you know, they're like trying to like take care of the customer, but they're also trying to have a quote. And like, and what we found was really, if we just flip the whole paradigm kind of upside down from the whole CEO, VP, you know, manager down to the customer and really made our customer the number one priority in the organization and made our store managers and then dipping down to having our uh, managers and the VP of that market and the regional VP being kind of the least important people in that whole totem pole 
uh, that we would grow and we would grow amazingly. It, it, and, and we did in those regions and markets that we did that. So at, I don't want to throw the whole servant leadership sound like, you know, 20 years ago, it just wasn't that popular of a thing. And we really chopped that up and did a number of series of trainings where we even as, as leaders ourselves trained, you know, brought and sent everybody down there, uh, Gary, where you're out of, out of Florida. I think we did it out of Tampa for a week long deal and, you know, presented how we wanted to serve our customers. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's about as good as I can give you, David. Oh, it's all fascinating. I love the, I love the journey. The, it reminds me, there's a, there's a friend of mine who runs a company and it's his company. He's owned it for, he inherited it from his father. Um, and well, I shouldn't say that he bought it from his father. Um, and he's been running it for 20 plus years and he is invested heavily in the next generation of leaders. Mm. And I've always been super impressed. I've, I've, I joke that he's who I want to be when I grow up um, <laughs> because he is just um, an amazing human, but his philosophy is so different than most people, especially I mean, his company is very successful and he's been very successful, but he's getting to the point. I mean, he's not old, uh, but he's getting closer to retirement. I don't think he's in anywhere. He's, five, 10 years from it, but he's thinking about it. He's been thinking about it for 10, 15 years. And so he has this whole leadership curriculum that he makes all of his people go through. And from that, he picks the next generation. And then a couple of years ago, he actually made the decision to get out of the organization in terms of leadership structure. He's still the chairman of the board because he owns the place, but he doesn't run the company anymore. He's Mm. got a CEO and he's got their attraction company. We've talked about that before. Traction is a way of organizing your business. So he has his CEO and the visionary and integrator, and those are not him. And he's on the, he's there as advising, but he just, now he just trains leaders full time, which is, So amazing. Now he's got an organization large enough to be able to do that, but there's part of me that's like, man, I mean, leadership training the next generation is so key. And yet so few companies take the time to actually do it, including mine. I'll flat out tell you, I ain't training anybody. A big part of that is probably because I feel inadequate to do so, but it's what an amazing thing you can create if you invest in that next generation. Yeah. I think probably my, um, well, we, we had, I'd say this, we had fun doing it and we learned a lot and we grew a lot just even as leaders, you know, 15, 20 years ago, when we we're going through this process. Uh, we, we grew a lot too. Uh, and, you know, even just, we did a lot of searching too. I mean, like really figuring out, you know, what were the headwinds that our employees were seeing on the front line and how could we as leaders, how could we enable our, leadership teams to like knock down barriers for literally the the person that was standing in front of the customer that was getting screamed at because their cigarette lighter plug didn't work. Of course, this is before ear pods and headphones and all that. But I mean, you know, circa, I started in this world in 95 back when the the phones were, you know, made out of the same material a football helmet was made out of a brick phone. So, um, um, and we, we exited about the time the, uh, just as the uh, iPhone was coming out, but, uh, it was it was it was fun to watch them be able to take care of customers, uh, give them the tools that they needed. And and then also, I, I think probably the, the key piece. So when you think about leadership, it's not just all fun and rosy and, you know, uh, cashing in, giving money to their emotional bank account. Like you got to take some back like you're still quoted. You still got to. So there's all this show me, teach me, coach me and hold me accountable is kind of the mantra that we used as a as a organization and as a sales organization on making sure that we showed our team how to do what it was we were expecting them um coach them to that i mean if you're throwing teaching somebody to throw a curveball i mean it's like let me show you how to do it and uh stand back if you want to video it you can but let's do it a couple of times and then coach let them do it right so teach them how to do it bring them in put their fingers on the laces whatever i'm, I'm not a curveball expert by any means right but it's like how do we how would we bring these employees in show them teach them how to do it and then coach them on what successful look like and what not being successful look like and then ultimately holding them accountable to that 
And so there was a clear, there was never this him running around going, oh, I wonder what I'm supposed to do in my job or how do I know if I had a successful day? Um, we could manage that. And we had metrics and scorecards set up so we could actually look at that daily. That's not to micromanage our people, David, don't get me wrong, and Gary, but um, as long as we were showing them, teaching them, coaching them, and ultimately hold them accountable to what we needed them to do, uh, there wasn't any confusion. If somebody for some reason got, you know, moved out of the organization for whatever reason, it was crystal clear as to why, especially when they were compared amongst their peers, which didn't happen that often. But I'm just saying, if you had to, you you know, um, we we had the dashboards to show it. Very cool. So how have you, so you went from technology to jumping into a, you know, culture kind of organization, right? Building culture and helping culture and, and yeah. helping people. That's a big shift. How did that, how did that come about? Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> that's another super question. So late, uh, 2017, uh, Larry, our CEO had called and, uh, said, um, Hey, I've become a uh, CEO. Uh, their um, search firm had, had found him and he had met with the board and they hired him. And he said, I, I'm just starting as the CEO of this organization you've never heard of called Corporate Chaplains of America. And I said, man, that's great. He said, I'm coming to town. And uh, he said, I'm meeting with, you know, one, some of our chaplain teams and the chaplain uh, in Little Rock, where I was from, uh, was, was actually a good friend of mine from our church. He actually, uh, long, long story, I won't go into it here, but he baptized me and the whole deal. And I baptized my daughter and anyhow, just has become a great friend. And so I knew, uh, this guy that worked there and I'm like, you know, I heard he was doing some great stuff, really caring for employees. He said, I'd love to hear more. So Larry comes to town, we're talking and, uh, and I'm thinking, man, is what y'all doing even legal? Like, is this even like, is this, how do y'all, what do you, like, what are y'all doing again? Like how, I mean, because at the time I'm, I was working for another a telecom company. Uh, and, and, uh, and so we're in the parking lot. He leaves and he calls me a couple weeks later and he said, okay, I'm building you a position. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, we want to, we want to grow. And we had this, uh, he had a very elaborate 85 page strategic uh, plan uh, David and uh, he sat down and walked me through it. He said, I'm, "I want to build a position," and uh, he said, "I don't know what I'm going to call it." Now he came he came up with chief growth officer. I did not, but he said, well, "We we want to grow the organization, and for all the right reasons, because we we really are passionate about taking care of people in the workplace, and we know that people are at times having some really tough times, and uh, we I think we can scale this thing uh, for all the right reasons." And uh, he said, I'm building you a job. And I looked at him and I thought, man, you're crazy. Uh, mm -hmm. I said, I'm not even remotely, I think, interested in this. Like, I don't, And at the time, I was a VP of sales for the S&B market at another telecom company. Uh, and uh, I just said, I don't, I just, I'm, I'm not, I, I said, I'm just, my mind's like, I'm loving what I'm hearing, but I'm just not, I'm not sure how this would work. And so long story short, met the chairman of the board who flew up there to Wake Forest in your backyard, just a sweet, sweet guy. I met the leadership team, sweet people and saw their heart for really trying to care for people. And I had been, I'd been in telecom for 23 years. I kind of had a season where I, I was kind of look, maybe looking to do something a little more uh, meaningful than just uh, broadband circuits and high capacity circuits to banks and hospitals. And so, um, he said you could bring some of your 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 leaders over. He said just build a team. You know how to build a team. You've done, you've been with me for years. You know how to do it. Just bring some of your folks over, and that's what we did. Two of my uh, former direct reports came over about thirty one thirty days later, one sixty days later, and we started building a team. And uh, that was uh, I don't know almost six years ago, five and a half years ago. So. Yeah, kind of a weird transition, you know, and I and I got a lot of those questions too, David, of just even friends going, now what are you doing? Like what like why are you why are you leaving like like the you know hot telecom sector? But I, you know, uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It's it's been um it's I've been fortunate to have a opportunity on the team here. It's been a great place to work. Your story reminds me of almost how me and Gary started working together. So I know I give him grief, but I've known him a very long this time. This crossed my mind. Did it? This crossed my mind when he was saying it. Yeah. So I want to hear your story. So, 
So I'm trying to think the first time Gary and I worked together. So in 2003, I got laid off of the company I was working for. I was a, a consultant uh, and it did, it was not going great. And it, the dot com bust happened. And so I get laid off and I decided, and this is, you know, dot com bust. No one wants to build websites, right? This is pets.com and everything exploded. And I decided, what am I going to do? I'm going to start a web company because that's people need websites. That's what I decided. <laughs> and so I, I've never been accused of being smart, but I, and my company was called Visionary Online, which, okay, sure. And um, that came from a game company that I was I did called Visionary Games. But anyway, so I think the first thing you ever did for me, correct me if I'm wrong, Gary, was the Visionary Online logo. This is yes. 2005. I had had it for a while and I built my own logo, which is a common thread. And then he finally rebuilt it for me. And it looked like an email envelope and i was like this is stupid graphical with gradients and yeah illustrative but this yeah. is so a uh, time of the time <laughs> it, it was it was so ugly but it was and it wasn't it, i'm saying that i thought it was ugly but the more i looked at it the more i loved it and that was when i realized that gary had a modicum of talent and we were we were friends again he was in florida i was in i was i'm friends with his brother um and we worked together and over the years, he started building logos and stuff for me. And then in 2013, I started Big Pixel. So we now fast forward a, several years. So I've now known Gary, um, you know, tangentially through his brother. And he is working, doing, you know, stupid little piddly stuff for some little media company. I don't know what it was. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and you're welcome. And, you know, barely making ends meet. And uh, <laughs> he was like winning Emmys or something. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and so... I am starting Big Pixel, and I'm pretty early on. I mean, it was pretty quick when I started getting clients. So we're now in 2014, 2015. I'm like, Gary, I want you to work for me. This is he was just gone off into freelancing. He's like, I'm going to do my freelance thing. I was like, Cool. I can't afford you right now, anyways. But we're going to work together. And he's like, Okay, whatever, man. And years passed, and then I started hiring him as a contractor, like a lot, yeah. <laughs> and more and more and more. And I think I became your client. Yeah. Uh, primary. I, I became his biggest client. And eventually, finally, I was like, Gary, you're coming to work for me. Just name your price. We'll figure it out from there. And I told him, I said, I'll pay you whatever you want to be paid. The more you want to be paid, the longer you're going to have to wait. <laughs> but <laughs> that is how we're going to do it. And because I knew this was going to work, this is how this was going to be. And so uh, finally, God, was it two years ago? Three? Two years I don't ago. remember. Two years ago. He, we finally got it all worked out and he, and we basically invented a job for him. I didn't have any clue what he, I mean, I knew he was talented, right? But I didn't know what he could do. I still don't. It, it, the sad and part I remember I hearing the phrase do. multiple times. Like, uh, I just, I just don't know how, like if I'll have enough work for you, but I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. We'll figure it out. Yeah. We'll figure it out. And that, so it reminded me a lot of your story. So finally we came together and what's funny is about Gary. And again, I love to give him grief, but, I keep learning he can do other things and that's, what's wild to me. And I'm sure your guys over at uh, chaplains are learning more and more because they just know they want to work with you. We'll figure it out. And that's a cool yeah. thing to do. Well, you know, so, you know, David, I don't know if you know, Larry, our CEO, but you know, Larry's and he's in C12 too, by the way, Will Dixon's group. He, uh, you know, he's run a, you know, billion dollar region for he was my uh, region president for a number of years uh actually based uh gary probably down the road from you there in uh, tampa but uh you know so he's there, and he's been in marketing he'd been in finance he was a naval officer i mean i just and i mean i'm not just trying to brag on him but it's like so how do you even as a nonprofit come in and bring a fortune you know 500 or even a fortune 250 mindset on how to scale because we're a little bit different business in the sense we're not just like nonprofit and hope uh, donors fund us to make this work. We do have a fee for service model. So there's kind of this recurring revenue. So allows us to scale and grow. And so it's taken his one finance background, marketing, our, in fact, our CFO uh, used to work for him when he got out of telecom, he went to uh, Geneva college and became uh, the, the CEO there and did that for, you know, probably about eight or nine years. And, and, uh, uh, 
took one of their leaders, and that's who's our CFO today here in Wake Forest. So, you know, he's taken just some people that have supported him in the past, some of his key lieutenants, and brought them all up underneath him under this uh, organization we're at now. And I can tell you, we run our leadership team meetings are as fast as any uh, big business that you could imagine. You know, um, I would say it's not run like probably the average typical nonprofit organization, and, and we're running it for the right reasons to grow it, to really, at the end of the day, take care of employees and their family and their friends. It seems like corporate chaplains might've started small, but then got really big. But I know that in order for like a small company like ours to utilize your services, and then I'm sure there's other large corporations, but I know that for sure because we talked to some of the chaplains, but that also use your services. I'm just curious, what would you say, give me like three examples. One would be like, the biggest company you didn't think would use you that does your average company. And then just like the weirdest or the strangest fit that seems to work. But at first you're like, I don't, I don't know if that's going to work. Yeah, Gary, uh, happy to answer that. So, you know, our largest being a large publicly traded company, they have, I want to say maybe we probably have 90 different people in our organization that supports that one company. So those, chaplains don't wow. care for just i mean they cha- chaplains will typically care for you know a handful of companies in their geographic Oops. areas yeah. yeah now we do have some that support just at their corporate campus for example we have a handful of chaplains that just support just their corporate campus facilities i mean it's a full-time job um and those are very you know uh you know very hands-on relational you're seeing the same chaplain come in every week uh, some of them you're seeing daily because they just live in a building and are just around and accessible. Um, then you have companies kind of what I'd say mid-tier. They may be smaller, let's say um, 50 to a couple of hundred in employees, which is probably more like the, the you know, mid to large size company in the United States. When you look at, you know, I just had a meeting at lunch and, you know, you look at about 91% of all the companies in the United States are like less than 50 employees, right? So, I mean, like most companies in the United States are just small business, right? I mean, the vast majority of those being sub, uh, you know, eight, nine employees even. And so our model, because we're a re- recurring revenue model, we can't just go send a chaplain to a company with four employees four times a month and even pay for gas, right? So there's there's kind of a model that we, that we do that. So to answer your question, the mid-tier – is maybe do an in-person rounds at a corporate office, but those remote employees, we reach out what we call distributed workforce model, where we reach out proactively and, you know, via text, via maybe a phone call, via email, however these employees want us to reach out because they're remote. And then the third one is um, really a crisis care only. And we have just launched, um, we just launched a new a QR code based, web-based app um, end of last year. Uh, basically, if you think of just QR codes, you scan a QR code for your organization, you could then be prompted into five different modes of reaching out to our chaplain. You could you could send a uh, you can call them, you can send a text, you could chat them just like live chat. Uh, you could schedule a video conference call, uh, or you could send an email, just an old school email. So we have kind of five modes of uh, of ways that employees of those companies could reach out. And what we do is basically place that QR code that's specific to your organization. And so that's kind of the third way that we come in. It's got crisis care only, which is not necessarily our preferred way. We love being able to visit and see people and shake hands and talk about the soccer tournament that y'all went to last week down in Orlando. How'd that go? Uh, But if a company has truly all remote employees, uh, then maybe that's an option. And we, we do serve some companies in that capacity. So really three ways, one in person, very relational weekly rounds. The other one, kind of a hybrid combination of that and proactive reaching out weekly via voice or text or however. And then that third would just be in kind of like an EAP, an employee assistance program or something today where you just, you call us if you need us and, and then we'll show up. Yeah, that makes sense. Those three different, like tiers of service seem to fit like the three different business models that you guys serve. And while we're on threes, um, something I want to ask you, we ask every guest, what are your top three pieces of advice for any entrepreneur or small business when they're getting started? 
Um, this you're probably going to have to take from your experience in leadership that I, I want to hear what these top three pieces of advice would be. You know, I, I'm going to give a plug to uh, David. You mentioned it, not me, C12. Honestly, I didn't know you were C12 part of that was called, but uh, I would say a, a peer group of some sort where you have common uh, like-minded folks around you, not necessarily in the same sick code or necessarily the same vertical that you're in, but leaders that you trust. And, and if it's, you just find some sage leaders that you can get together with once a month, once a quarter, once a week and have coffee, breakfast, lunch, dinner, whatever, go play golf, whatever that looks like. I think finding people that have been successful in business and allowing them to allow you to be part of that conversation. So, you know, C12 is, is just happens to be one of our strategic, uh, we are a strategic alliance partner with them. And um, we serve, you know, probably a third of the companies we serve, David, are somehow related to C12 in some form or fashion. So, uh, you know, a lot of those companies are very intentional, obviously, in caring for their employees. But I would say one, uh, Gary, find some like-minded people and find some kind of peer group, uh, even if it's just in your specific uh, wheelhouse of the business you're in or other. Uh, The other thing, you said three, is that right? So I may give you a four here. Yeah. I'll give you a bonus. Um, The other thing I see, because I travel weekly all over the United States from West Coast to East Coast, and I see businesses even we support, and and I'm I'm asking them questions uh, similar to this, not necessarily what would you start a business, like what are the headwinds in your organization? Are there things that we could help our chaplains or care coaches as we're as we're stepping back and trying to meld with their culture and what are things you see going on? And I would say one thing, uh, and this is easy for me to say because I'm not carrying the checkbook for this, but I think paying a fair and or above wage for some of your talent uh, makes sense. I've, I've, we, we have some companies that are paying for the lower uh, hourly wages um, and I say our customers, just companies in general. And this, I say this as I'm stuck in the airport in Minneapolis the other day and I go by a restaurant and they're saying, well, we're we're not serving burgers right now because we don't have a cook. And it just kind of hurts my heart a little bit. It's like, but I'm in the airport, so I know you're going to charge me like $22 for the burger and probably another $7 yeah. for the fries and probably $4 for the bottle of water. I mean, right? And so I would say maybe just consider – uh, paying up market a little bit, depending on the job. I'm not saying the, the, your minimum wage jobs need to go up market, but I can tell listening to, to some of the companies that we speak that have gone um, and paying a little bit more, I've seen just be able to keep employees around because on some of these very transactional organizations where people are just churning and burning for the next nickel or whatever, I mean, those, some of those companies are really hurting and have a lot, have a lot of pressure. So I think that there's maybe any way to, to pay up market, certainly in some key p- positions, it may be worth it just to get the talent so you're not, don't have another week or month or a quarter of downtime not having somebody in that key spot on your team. Um, I think the, the other one is, and this is just from a, um, and I'm putting my entrepreneur hat because my wife has been a previous entre- entrepreneur, I me mean, not so much, but I think, um, you know, uh, maybe hiring out services so when i look at some companies and they're they're small to mid you know going and hiring a full-time finance person uh uh or a full-time marketing team. i even look at how we kind of reorged our organization david to your point earlier when we came in we kind of went kind of with some boutique vendors when i look at our marketing vendors i look at our you know seo and i look at our web design folk i mean it's like Instead of going and hiring those people that I think probably back in the day made sense, you know, you need a marketing person or two or three to help do this stuff. It's like we've hired some specific folks that are like experts in that, right? Like your organization where I'm not. So we went out and I think going and finding maybe a fractional finance person or a fractional um, marketing person or a fractional HR person on the back end to help with some of your typical HR stuff or just the average small mid-sized company i've just i've seen some companies kind of go that route here lately uh that we support which i think make a lot of sense because they're able to i think get top talent in that field but are paying kind of a contractor type uh 
I don't want to say a 1099 rate. We've actually a, had, a con- yeah. we've had some of those people on the podcast as our guests, people that offer their services yeah. for like the fractional, you know, so many hours per month for the smaller businesses or whatever. We get the expert yeah. service, yeah. the expert experience, but you're not paying a full-time rate for that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, it, it I think seems that seems to be I a just, very, I, yeah. Yeah. That, that's just a trend that I see. Small yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't pretend to be an entrepreneurial expert, but I, that is a trend that I just see, you know, flying around weekly. That is is a good. You know, people are getting really good talent, and because these are vendors, if it's not working out, terminate the contract agreement, whatever that looks like, and just yeah. find you another one that fits. You know. You actually even mentioned two of the popular ones: the uh, finance and HR. Those are. Yeah, yeah, those are. I guess from each of those sectors here. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and you can imagine just all the legalese that goes on with an expert in HR, right? I mean, just to make sure you're compliant, even with like your insurance and stuff like that, just abs- uh, yeah. whatever you Ab- can offer. Yeah, a- absolutely. Now I will say we have full-time HR people. We have full, full-time finance people in our organization, but we do, I do manage some of those vendor relationships on just, when you think of just the marketing and, lead gen and um kind of the, the sale the salesy stuff getting the word out of what we do uh makes a lot of sense speaking of getting the word out good segue if anybody else wants to learn they more about you and your business how would they get a hold of you what would be the easiest way to learn more about corporate chapel yeah i think just go to chaplain.org c-h-a-p-l-a-i-n.org um there's uh, there's there's videos out there. There's you could set up a uh, uh, a presentation. Uh, the field development people that are on our team they travel weekly just like I do. I've got some scattered literally in all four corners of the United States. Literally today, um, we're happy to show up and and just talk to you about your organization and see if uh, if we could come alongside you and help care for your employees. Or you could just reach out to me uh, directly. My email is jbates at chaplain.org. That's J is in Jason, last name Bates, B-A-T-E-S at chaplain.org. And reach out to me directly and we'd love to have a conversation. This is this is my role in the organization is to kind of help explain uh, to people what we do and how we do it. And we're happy to present to, you know, the entire leadership team or just the sole entre- entrepreneur owner, if, if you want to. You know, we, we do deal too with a lot of companies. You know, as you get larger, there may be, you know, family members involved or whatever, we're happy to come along and talk to everybody. First, second, third, fourth generation, we'll talk to all of them. And we will put those links in the show notes too. And also your okay. LinkedIn. We'll, we'll put that yeah. in there as well. Sure, thanks. Appreciate it. If Gary, if they wanted to get in touch with us, how would they do that? If they want to reach out to us, they can email us at hello at thebigpixel.net. If you have any questions or comments, you could put those below this video in the comments section or reach out to us on social media. Well, thank you so much, Jason, for joining us. I appreciate your time. It's been a lot of fun. Yep. Gary, David, thank you for your time. I hope you'll have a great rest of your week. Yeah, man. It was nice meeting you. All righty. Well, we will be back next week. Thank you guys so much.